The Unshackled Ways, Episode 74. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode, and I am joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukut Fernando. Hello again. Hi, Tim, and hello, everyone. It's been another big news week, so we're, we're going to be pressed to cram it all into this podcast. Uh, the biggest story of the week is probably there was a another Australian terrorist plot uh, uncovered. Uh, four people, uh, two fathers and two sons of Lebanese background were taken into custody. They were planning to smuggle an explosive device onto an aircraft, so this has caused uh, security mayhem uh, at our major airports. Again, this shows that our immigration policy needs to change. Meanwhile, Bill Shorten, he decided that if he wins the next election, he wants referendums on uh, Australia becoming a republic and also fixed four-year terms, add this to the uh, calls for there to be a referendum on Indigenous recognition and also re uh, repealing Section 44 of the Constitution. The political class, they seem to want all sorts of changes to our Constitution, uh, but the question, of course, is do the people? Uh, Same-sex marriage is in the news uh, yet again. Uh, this time it's uh, rogue gay Liberal MPs. They're plotting to introduce a private member's bill into Parliament, which will break the party's promise to hold a plebiscite uh, on the issue. And this threatens to tear the Liberal Party apart when Parliament resumes next week. Uh, also in the news, the Australian Human Rights Commission, that wonderful organisation, released a report uh, alleging a sexual assault epi epidemic on Australian university campuses. Or even though the report was only released uh, yesterday at the time of this recording, the flaws uh, in the report have already been highlighted and those uh, behind the report, it's clear that they have an agenda that, we're, that they're pushing. Meanwhile, Trump uh, caused outrage last week when he tweeted that there would be a ban on transgender individuals serving in the military in any capacity. Now, there's been a lot of debate about whether this ban was needed and also questions about uh, did he do this to distract from other controversies or did he do it as a political deal to get uh, funding for the wall. But we'll start with the uh, latest uh, terror plot, or I should say Islamic terror plot, because you know, <laughs> what else is that likely to be? <laughs> so the raids occurred Saturday night. There's, four, uh, as I said, four people in custody. Five properties were raided. Now, one was released today without charge. Uh, the, the suspects, they, they weren't actually charged with anything. They were only detained under anti-terror laws. And uh, as I said, it's caused massive delays that, you know, airports, people advise to get there two, three hours uh, before their flights. And it's also the same week as three individuals pled guilty to another Islamic terror plot, uh, which, uh, which they were first arrested for back in 2014. And there's also the findings of the, the inquest into uh, Newman Hader, who tried to stab two police officers. They ended up having to uh, k uh, kill him. And the report said the police had no other options. So it's 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 still a, a big threat in Australia. Islam is always a threat in Australia. You know, I think um, ultimately we will keep continue. We will keep saying the exact same thing. Ultimately, it's thanks to uh, I think um, I wouldn't say bad immigration policies, but I would say careless immigration policies. I mean, our policies are okay but you know they do leave out various threats that could still enter our country and our politicians are not caring about that now i know after after this event i know pauline hansen was quick to um make a facebook post saying that this these people they weren't buddhist terrorists they weren't hindu terrorists they weren't christian terrorists they were islamic terrorists and it's been happening all all this time you know it's been happening thanks to islam and our leaders continue continue to ignore any connection between islam and terrorism i understand not all muslims are terrorists many Muslims are peaceful but the fact is there are lots of lots of 
terrorists who are Islamic, and there is a connection between terrorism and Islam, and our politicians continue, um, you know, ignoring that. And I think I am thankful for our security services and for our police for actually uncovering this. And I think this does raise some concerns about in the future about the new changes to the home affairs, um, to our security services. So you know, this this. Uh, this um, we may we may have been able to actually um, find out about these terror plots um, thanks to our former um, you know security service apparatus, but these new changes may actually um, hinder in the future um, as seen in Britain. So I think it brings in lots of you know topics into it. So we have the home affairs, we have the Islamic immigration. It brings a lot of topics into this um, into the situation. Uh, it was interesting that uh, Peter Dutton, who we're both big fans of, said that. Uh, 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 border security is not just about uh, stuffing the boats, it's also who's coming in the, the front door. He didn't elaborate yeah. on that, but that is ab absolutely uh, right. And yeah. it's clear, I mean, these uh, suspects were of Lebanese Muslim background, which uh, they came in uh, post the uh, Lebanese Civil War back in, I believe it was the, the late 70s, which Peter Dutton has previously said was a mistake. And so uh, this is a past immigration mistake. And so we need to make sure that we don't continue to make those, those yeah. mistakes and, con and continue to let in more future terrorists. Because as I mentioned, there's you know, this wasn't the only uh, t uh, terror incident in the news. There are also those court proceedings as well. So, yeah, we need to make sure that, you know, we, d we don't have th these happening on a more regular basis. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, we need to also make sure that, as I mentioned, with the Home Affairs as well, we need to make sure that they are able to continue um, to actually find out these plots into the future. Now, th th I'm concerned that, you know, if, if these changes, they might actually, um, you know, make it, harder for them to actually find out um, about these terror plots and investigate them as people have seen in the UK for example where the people just let them go um, and didn't really investigate them much and as you mentioned yeah I mean the left says that you know we already have Muslims here you know, you know what's the point in stopping them well the point is we will try and stop future terrorists from coming here we will try and stop more terrorists from coming here that is the point do you want more terrorists here or do you want you know less terrorists here um and you know the and the ultimate point is that these people would not be terrorizing our country wouldn't be such a threat to our lives and livelihoods if we listened to the conservatives and the nationalists back then and didn't allow in Lebanese refugees into our country because because ultimately it's everyone else who has to suffer and endure through this particular situation. Uh, I, I'm always amused by the leftist logic. Well, we already have Muslims here, so let's just keep keep importing more. It's basically like, oh, it's too late, so we'll just make the problem worse. Like, you know, that, that's a great strategy. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, it just shows how dumb they are. Ultimately, they're saying that you know, just we have them here, so we're just take, taking more of them. It's, it's you know, if if we said that about things like sexual assault or something, or about uh, something something they actually care about, they'll be outraged. And if we said that, they'll be outraged. But they're actually saying that the safety and security of our people, the people who already live here, um, is much less important than appealing to the feelings of the United Nations or appealing to the feelings of particular refugee advocate groups or whoever is involved in this process um, and they are completely oblivious to the fact that bringing in more of them results in you know greater greater dangers to us um, and as we mentioned there is a, a huge correlation a huge relationship between terrorism and Islam um, you may you may blame lots of things for that but the fact is the fact is there is a huge connection between these two um, particular concepts terrorism and Islam and if, if lefties don't want to pay attention to that and actually investigate them, that then it's our safety that's actually, you know, at stake. Well, there were a few conspiracy theorists uh, out who said that, uh, you know, this yes. uh, uh, anti-terror operation, it was designed to, you know, rescue Malcolm Turnbull's, you know, position uh, in, in the polls. I mean, uh, so that basically by logic would mean that every terrorist attack that actually happens is... A you know governments have allowed to happen, which doesn't. Um, yeah, that doesn't. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure our leftist governments would not want to create more Islamophobia in society. I'm pretty sure. Um, so you know. No, I mean that's just stupid. She apologized. I know that. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just not going to pay attention to much to her because that is completely stupid. Um, and she's again. Who is this? 
the lady at uh, the Labour MP, she um she was one who said it was a conspiracy theory and said that you know this was just well she was one of the people who said this was a theory and you know it was just a some tactic um by uh, Malcolm Turnbull to rescue himself and you know distract people. Again, you know I completely just I I completely you know I want to ignore her and her stupid logic because. It's it's completely unfathomable that you are gonna use this to use the situation. You know, it concerns the safety of thousands of people. Okay, um, and you're gonna use the situation, and you know, make up some some weird story about it. But you're not gonna focus on the actual issue. That is the left. That is the modern left. And you know, you show that they are completely useless in our country and in our political atmosphere. Uh, I, I don't think Malcolm Turnbull, the, the Prime Minister who loves going to Islamic yeah. museums, yeah. Uh, holding, you know, itfa dinners, uh, you know, really wants to, you know, whip up, you know, so-called Islamophobia. Exactly. I mean, these are leftist politicians, and I'm pretty sure they don't want to do that, um, you know, to actually conjure up more, you know, anti-Islam hate or Islamophobia or whatever you want to call it, or racism or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and furthermore... The thing is, the left is blaming us for conspiracy theories. They are the ones who are blaming us for creating all these far-fetched conspiracy theories about how Islam wants to infiltrate and take over our country. But it was last week, um, well, it was it was early this week actually that um, Muhammad El Muhel Muhammad El Muhelhi, um of Halal um, Certification Authority in Australia, it was just earlier this week that he said that you know he wanted to um, he wanted to see Islamic men interbreed with Australian women because apparently white people are a dying race and he is the one who's advocating for an actual takeover an actual Islamic takeover but the left continues to blame us for thinking about conspiracy theories um, about Islam and its uh, and its um, ultimate goal to take over Western society yeah that was uh, bizarre by uh, Muhammad Al Mahoney, I mean, you know, uh, what he what he said. Well, well, that's a whole other topic. But it, ju it just shows if he is, you know, the exemplar of, you know, uh, Islam in Australia, yeah. then we're in big trouble. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. It just shows that, you know, it just shows why many of these events probably are happening. I mean, it just gives us a glimpse into what many people probably have inside their brains. And, you know, it kind of further supports the idea that we need to impose an Islamic immigration ban in this country because it just shows that we cannot trust these people. And it sort of further explains why these particular terror plots are being uncovered. Um, thankfully, thankfully, we have a very good security system and security apparatus. But, you know, ultimately it shows that, you know, that the, the risk is always there. And it shows that these people are ultimately violent and they have all these weird bizarre thoughts inside their heads yeah definitely oh while malcolm turnbull was dealing with national security on the weekend uh, bill shorten was busy uh talking up how he wanted australia to become a republic and he was going to take action in his first term he wants to hold a uh, two-part referendum first he uh, once a plebiscite asking Australians whether they want uh, an Australian head of state, which is funny because I thought that he didn't like plebiscites. <laughs> and then he wants a, a referendum on the preferred uh, Republican model. Now, the La uh, Labour Party policy is to support a republic. In the Liberal Party, it's a free vote. And he also wants fixed four-year terms for federal parliament, which will also require a, a referendum. It's, so the political, uh, political class, they also want referendums on repealing Section 44 because they want, uh, they think that, you know, dual citizens and public servants should be able to run for parliament. And then there's the uh, referendum on Indigenous uh, recognition, which seems to be, it's been in the the, uh, the pipeline for years, but uh, it keeps getting delayed because the Indigenous activists, they always keep having more and more insane demands. Well, yeah, Bill Shorten, he's got all these grand plans for referendums, but the question is, would any of them actually succeed? I'm just completely, you know, ashamed and frustrated at the fact that they are they want a plebiscite, but they have no idea how traumatizing it will be to monarchists around the country. I mean, it's going to result in such anti-monarchist hate, um, you know, such uh, such anti-monarchist phobia, um, and that's going to result in that's going to be very traumatizing for all the monarchists around the country. I mean, if they 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 have the nerve to care about 
you know, uh, how facts are going to hurt particular people when it comes to the same-sex marriage plebiscite, but they have, you, you know, I'm just trying to make it an, 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 an ironic um, sort of comparison, but the thing is, you know, they are trying to have this plebiscite, I think, in order to have greater control on Australians. Because the thing is, if we become a refer referendum, it's going to result in our constitution being changed all over. It's going to result in a new constitution. And given the day and age we live in, I am completely scared about that. You know, we live in a day and age where they want to um, s have surveillance on us, you know, on our dinner tables. You know, Gillian Triggered, Gillian Triggs wants to have surveillance on us, um, on our dinner tables, because she she's um, scared and she's concerned that we will continue to be racist around our dinner tables. That is the day and age we live in. And if we have a republic, um, a, a, a referendum, ultimately for a republic, that means a new constitution. That means they can actually frame that constitution but according to their own ideas and their own um, desires. Oh, it doesn't actually mean a new constitution. It just means the constitution is amended. So Australia is a, is a republic. If it's the, the Labour Party, they're aware that it's got to, for, for uh, any referendum to ex succeed, it's got to require uh, minimal change. Uh, now, the, the polling suggests that there's a wafer-thin majority of Australians supporting a republic, but of course, uh, when it comes to the actual vote, Australians will be a bit more sceptical, saying, you know, yeah. do, I, do I really want to change uh, the system which se seems to be working? Uh, I myself, I, like, I'm a republican in theory, um, but I just think that any... Uh, a republic referendum process is just going to fall down because nobody's going to be able to agree on you know yeah. what what models the best and there's you can't you can't really say that the system at the moment is broken that it's not working yeah i mean i'm a monarchist you know so i definitely oppose any referendum or any republic but, but i think even if it doesn't matter if you're a republican or a, or a monarchist i think you know this current situation is not the correct it's not the right time for such a referendum or such a I, I don't think it's suitable to have something like that in this particular time we had that quite recently in you know in, in last century we had that quite recently um and the monarchists won so i think for now the the current situation is okay there is no need to fix it as you mentioned um and you know having ties with the uk is good for us you know having ties with britain is good for us in the long run i would say um you know i know that the uk has sort of turned us turned their backs in some ways by pre preventing australians from well making it harder for australians to migrate there but you know i think ultimately they're they're um is it is beneficial for Australia to be with the UK for now at least you know and given the circumstances I don't think such a plebiscite is suitable uh, there'd have to be a real crisis with the, yeah. the constitutional monarchy yeah. I mean if Britain became an Islamic state which yeah. you know, who knows, yeah. or if you know Prince Charles or uh, and King Charles because uh, he is a big climate uh, change advocate decided to yeah. have a, a carbon tax by royal decree that yeah. might cause some problems yeah, I mean, yeah, King Charles might be quite scary because um, I'm hoping it goes to William. Um, but we'll, that's a different that's a different topic. But you know, um, and William as well. That reminds me that you know, many people in this country they they love Prince William. You know, yeah. yeah so I mean, no matter if you're a Republican or monarchist, many people still like him. Um, many people don't like Prince um, Prince Charles, but the thing is, um, it's quite likely that he won't be given the throne, um, and that Prince William will get in um instead. And if that happens, then you know, people might actually regret voting for a republic if there is a plebiscite or if there is a referendum. So I think for now, due to the changes and due to the current situation, I think it's best to you know keep things the way they are for now. Oh yeah, if uh, Australia gets uh, King William and uh, Queen Kate Middleton, the Republican yeah. movement's dead. Dead, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they are you know so beloved as you know a royal couple and like their children on the cover of like magazines. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's why uh, you know, Malcolm Turnbull says we've got to wait until the Queen dies because they believe yeah. that, you know, King Charles is their only hope to, to get a republic. Yeah, you know, yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think uh, it's best to, you know, wait for this. I think it's best to at least wait until the Queen does pass away. Um, you know, which will take, hopefully, which will take some time, hopefully. Um, because, you know, again, that's a better, that's a better situation. That's a better opportunity for something like that.
And the fixed four-year terms uh, referendum, so there was polling done yesterday by Central Media which said that 58% of uh, voters supported it. Now, this might pass because there was a recent uh, referendum in Queensland to have fixed four-year terms for their parliament, and that passed 52-48. And I don't think Australians like, you know, voting on average every two and a half years for an election. So I think they'd actually, you know, might vote for, yes, we will vote now so, you know, you don't make us vote, you know, more regularly. Yeah, I think it might make it a bit more convenient um, for, for Australian people if they could vote a bit less frequently. Um, I'm not sure um, because thing is, if you do have four-year terms and, and, a, and a bad government gets in there, you know, it might sort of lengthen their, the time they have to impose whatever they want to impose. Um, so there's that, but then that risk is, I mean, that risk is always there ultimately. Um, you know, I, I guess four-year terms sounds good um, because, you know, it, it seems like a sort of a, a, the middle, this middle ground, you know, not, not too long, not too short, um, you know, but let's hope we do get good governments, you know, in order to make, you know, in order to have those four years actually be beneficial for us. I, I mean, I, I think there sh should still be a, you know, option to, like, go to an early election, but only through, yeah. like, a double dissolution trigger, because if, yeah. like, there is dysfunction between uh, the lower house and the, the Senate, then obviously you would have to have an election to resolve uh, whatever, you know, legislative block there is. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that that would be much better. I think you know. Um, well, I think it's best to see what happens in Queensland. I wouldn't say this is a very huge issue. Um, you know, it's. I think it's best to see what, what what would happen in Queensland first, and then maybe move on from there. You know, use Queensland as some sort of experiment for this for this scenario. Uh, and of course, as we said with the Indigenous referendum, I mean now the you know as so-called Indigenous leaders, they're demanding a Indigenous not a parliament but a advisory body, which like th that's that's not what the constitutional recognitions uh, movement started off as. So it's just getting their demands are getting more and more extreme. So I don't think that's going to get anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, they keep asking for more and more. And interestingly, um, there are many indigenous leaders who are saying, you know, they, they disagree with homosexuality, they disagree with same-sex marriage, you know, and, and those views have actually risen up during, thanks to this um, debate and discussion regarding the constitutional recognition. And the thing is, it's funny how the left doesn't care about that. The left hasn't really, the left sort of turns a blind eye towards those opinions, but then, you know, chooses to focus on this. But, you know, I think I think you know that that particular discussion has brought sort of opened a can of worms and brought in all these various issues, and they keep asking for more and more and more. Um, you know, this country isn't meant to be divided like that based on skin color like that, um, because you know you, you're all Australian. That's that's sort of what this country is about. So I think dividing this country on racial lines is going to result in greater um, ethnic divisions, and I think it's going to you know it's look at what's happening in South Africa, for example. That's the extreme of what could happen. So I think, you know, if that does, if we do divide ourselves on racial lines, it's going to get the, the, the cohesion in this country will get worse. You know, Bill Shorten says, Bill Shorten says inequalities are a threat to cohesion, but no, it's actually these particular um, you know, demands for recognition or whatever, these are the ones that cause, uh, well, that, that impact on social cohesion. Uh, and of course, we've previously talked about a proposed referendum to uh, repeal or modify section 44 and like good luck asking the people you know do yeah. you want foreigners representing you in parliament i mean that's that's just not going to happen yeah i mean these uh, these sites and our friends are just they seem like a complete waste of time and money when you look at some of them. I mean, some of them are asking Australian people, do you want someone with other interests, someone with divided interests, divided loyalties, representing this country and representing your electorate? No, people wouldn't want that. I mean, who would want someone who could who could still have some sort of hidden agenda to another country, um, you know, can ha have a say in what happens here? If you have a Saudi Arabian person, Okay, or a Chinese person with you know with links to Chinese government. We already have problems with Sam Destiari and his Chinese links. If we have a, an actual Chinese person, you know, with links to Chinese government in Parliament, that's going to be a huge problem, and that's going to further the vassalization of our country to China. So I think that, that that's not going to work, and you know, it it won't win, and it's just going to be a waste of time and money.
Oh, one vote which definitely should take place is the plebiscite on same-sex marriage. We've learned yeah. this week that uh, uh, gay Liberal MPs, they're working on a private member's bill uh, for when Parliament resumes next week. Uh, now, the, for, for the bill to actually get to the floor of the House of Representatives, the uh, standing orders have to be suspended so it can be debated, and Liberal MPs, they can't vote against their party on procedural matters, so we have no idea on how they're actually paying to get this to the floor of the Parliament, but it's interesting to know, guess who is in charge of deciding what bills get to the floor of the House of Representatives? Well, I don't know, you, you, you had to tell us. Uh, Christopher Pine. He's the, right. he, he's the leader of the House, so he decides right. what. And, of course, he was on that tape saying, I think we're going to get same-sex marriage very, very soon. Yeah. So, obviously, having this uh, uh, private members' bill in Parliament would be a clear violation of the Coalition's le election commitment to hold a uh, plebiscite. And, you know, just because other promises have been broken doesn't, it doesn't make breaking this one right. I mean, like, two wrongs don't make a right. Like, you know, why bother making election commitments then? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, people vote for you based on what you promise. I am completely, I'm just completely sick of this entire topic now. You know, we have been saying the exact same thing over and over again, you know, expressing our frustrations on how these MPs seem to be under the notion that we don't matter, that their promises don't matter, and they'll just do whatever they want and, you know, act like rogue MPs, cross the floor whenever they want to, um, and, you know, deviate from their party's commitments and from their party's election promises. We've been talking about this for months, and, you know, we were promised a plebiscite, and you'll give us a plebiscite, or else, you know, you, you, we will, you will lose next election. Yeah. Oh, well, there's already been talk that uh, they, because they, yeah, all, all the, or well, most of the MPs behind this, uh, you know, gay themselves, which yeah. brings up another question, you know, yeah. uh, can, you know, gay MPs in the Liberal Party be trusted not to let their, like, sexuality cloud their political judgment? Uh, they've yeah. been warned that their, their pre-selections could come under threat, which I think is, you know, fair. If you're going to, yeah. you know, go against what was what was a core election commitment of the Liberal Party, then it's quite right that people will say maybe you shouldn't represent us in Parliament. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's almost like we are invisible, invisible to them. It's more, it's almost like you know we don't exist. Yeah, you know, they they have completely rejected the Australian people, and they want to have their little you know little moment of fame and cross the floor, and you know just 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 try and get this free vote, which they weren't promised, they promised a plebiscite, and they may even have their own, you know, hidden agenda, hidden motives for this. You know, we can't trust people, and I think, you know, changes to pre-selection will be quite good. Uh, and Turnbull's even been warned that there could be potential leadership uh, ramifications if uh, yeah. you know, these MPs crossing the floor uh, happens. Uh, now, Tur Turnbull today, he is sticking with, you know, that the policy is clear that uh, it was to have a plebiscite. Now, um, the option of a postal plebiscite uh, looks uh, more likely, which would still fulfil the election promise, because uh, let's not forget the recent polls. I mean, they say that majority of Australians, you know, want same-sex marriage, but they also say the majority of Australians want a plebiscite. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if the left uses the fact that the majority of Australians want a want same-sex marriage in order to support a free vote. But then when polls say that the majority want a plebiscite, they keep rejecting it. So they ha they're inconsistent, as always. As usual, they are being inconsistent. Um, but I'm I'm just completely, you know, frustrated by these MPs um, who are ultimately um, risking the success of their own party, because if Malcolm Turnbull is unable to hold them back, then these rogue MPs will cross the floor, and that means another leadership spill, and that's going to be bad for the entire party. It's going to be bad for the entire country, because if the Liberals lose, which they likely will if this if this keeps happening, then we'll have a Labour government and imagine what that's going to bring. Um, so, you know, I think these people are just being completely selfish. Um, I don't know why they would do it. I can't fathom why they would, you know, go against those promises and try and get their own thing done. Um, I'm just, I just hope they can get their, they can get their, get their problems together.
And if they did move to a free vote, it would be basically caving into the Labor Party and the Greens who, you know, want a a free vote. And that's the whole reason why Labor and the Greens blocked the plebiscite, because they wanted to, you know, pressure the Liberals into, you know, adopting a free vote. And Bill Shorten's probably, you know, loving what's, you know, Mm -hmm. the division that's going on at the, the moment and would be thinking that his tactic of blocking the plebiscite has worked. Yeah, you know, I think the left needs to understand that this is a democracy. I think, you know, those left liberal MPs also must understand this is a democracy. Um, Bill Shorten obviously is not very loyal to our democracy, uh, so it seems. Um, so I just hope, you know, I just hope they can, they can solve this problem and maybe, you know, actually have the post plebiscite. side. I mean, if if most Australians support it, then why are you scared? I mean, if you're if you're weak minded and you're scared, you'll somehow get triggered by hearing other people opinions then learn to be strong-minded don't promote weak-mindedness and just you know be able to handle other people's opinions that's what you need to do i mean you're a human being for goodness sake you need to be able to handle opinions yeah I, i'm sick of all of these you know lame excuses against yeah. you know, having a plebiscite be too triggered i you know i want yeah. uh, one of the main reasons i want the pre- plebiscite is because uh, cause i want the leftists to have to you know suck it up the democratic process you know if you want this reform then can convince the people yeah in a, in a vote yeah, I mean, your complaints are ultimately, you know, uh, co- well, maybe it's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing, ultimately. Um, they're ultimately costing your own side. It's ultimately discrediting your own side, your complaints. Um, so, you know, if you want to have some, have, make this change, then, you know, maybe can make the case for it instead of getting triggered and, you know, just going behind feminists who are defending you. Now, let's talk about the alleged sexual assault epidemic on Australian university campuses. So uh, yesterday, the Australian Human Rights Commission released their report on uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment on Australian university campuses, and it revealed that 51% of students had been sexually harassed and 6.9% had been sexually assaulted, which... You know, the the mainstream media reported like, God, this is, you know, terrible. And I saw all the, you know, Greens MPs, Sarah Hansen, Young, Lee Rhiannon, you know, repost it saying how shocking it is. But, you know, it, it doesn't take long, like, you know, just looking at the report briefly to see the flaws in it. I mean... Uh, the report only had a response rate of 9.7%. And, you know, so it's hardly, you know, representative. And... And also we learnt that, you know, the definition of uh, sexual harassment is, uh, you know, quite loose, which includes things like yeah. staring, like asking, you know, about someone's, you know, private life. I mean, you know, innocuous things like that and just exposes it as, you know, a joke. It's, yeah, it's completely invalid. It's a joke. It's invalid. Um, I, go, I go to Sydney University and I've seen all these posters everywhere, um, you know, calling for women to rise up and don't, you know, sort of, sort of don't be quiet or don't be silent about your own um, experience. I'm pretty sure, I'm, 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 I'm sure the left wants to, um, you know, make it look like there are more sexual assaults than there actually are. Firstly, you mentioned how the um, response rate was low, you know, 9%. Second, we live in a day and age where, you know, staring, catcalling, you know, asking particular questions, they can be classified as sexual harassment. That's the that's the age we live in. I mean, remember with, with Humongous, for example, you know, Humongous, um, you know, said his name was Humongous and the feminists got triggered. Um, yeah, I think, said it was I think sexual that's, harassment. Exactly. That is the day and age we live in. Um, so, you know, I, I just completely think this is invalid because, you know, the questions are, seem invalid, the questions seem loose, and we don't have a rape epidemic, we don't have a sexual harassment epidemic. Um, and I will say this, I will say that both genders, both genders get into sexual harassment um, thanks to their own stupidity sometimes you know i may sound like i'm victim blaming and this is going to be very controversial but i mean many of these situations happen when people are either drunk or you know high on drugs okay and you know both both genders okay so i'm just going to say i was put out there that you know sometimes you bring this stuff upon yourself in some cases well regret is not rape i mean if you wake up the next morning like oh you know i don't feel that i should i should have done that i mean that's you know yeah. not uh, not rape and, and let's not forget yeah. that uh these statistics included incidents that didn't even happen on campus so you know it's called 
you know, sexual assault and harassment on, you know, Australian universities, yet it includes <laughs> incidents that, you know, weren't, weren't even there. And, you know, let, and let's, and let's not forget that, you know, the... Uh, we all know about the Australian Human Rights Commission. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, Julian Triggs is now left, thank God. But, uh, you know, it's it's easy to see that a report like this, you know, has their fingerprints all over it. And the yeah. Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, she thanks, you know, introduction groups such as the Hunting Ground Australia Project, which is that sensationalized, you know, documentary from the United States, you know, uh, alleging, you know, that there's a rape culture on US campuses. Also, uh, thank National Union of Students, you know, the left-wing student group, also the uh, end rape on campuses, and also there, there's uh, apparently a Australian Human Rights Law Centre which uh, they also assisted with the report. So uh, they lobbied and assisted with the report, these groups, and surprise, surprise, it got the, you know, answer that they were desiring. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that these people um, framed the questions to get the answer they wanted. Um, you know, I think, and the fact that these, these were sponsored and supported by these particular groups kind of shows that it's quite biased. Um, you know, and I'm pretty sure anyone with, with a mind can come to the conclusion that, you know, 51% of students are, do not face this, um, this sort of uh, situation. You know, it's, it's all completely, I think, sensationalized and biased, and it, it's framed, the survey is framed, just like many leftist surveys are framed in order to, you know, get information that supports their hypothesis, um, you know, which doesn't work. It doesn't work, and it completely misleads people because there is no rape culture in campus in Australia or America. If you want to see rape culture, go to the Middle East, go to Afghanistan, go to where women are, you know, ca women are actually, actually assaulted, um, you know, for, for walking alone, outside of walking alone, alone without a husband outside, go to Afghanistan. You know, that's, that's, that's actual, you know, uh, I don't know, sexism or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, we, this is Australia and this problem is not here. And the Human Rights Commission, they actually conceded in the report that those who are, you know, more likely to care about this issue or feel that, you know, they've been victims of sexual assault are more likely to, you know, respond to it because, you know, they want to influence the, the result. But what I found uh, quite bizarre with, like, the feminist and social justice warriors is they want to claim that, like, university is the most dangerous place for women when it's full of, you know, left-wing people and teaching left-wing ideas, like they're basically saying that left-wing men are more prone to, yeah. you know, uh, rape and sexual assault. I think that's quite true. I, you know, I, I, you know, I actually think, I actually feel like that is quite true. I think, um, I feel like left, we have similar leftists like, we have similar antifighters like, I wouldn't be surprised if leftist men um, were actually much more prone to committing these, 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 very bad acts, these you know horrid acts, um, if you know, actual sexual assault. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be surprised because since given their violence, given their behavior over the past few years, um, but it does seem like if I was to use their logic, you know, if I was to use their sort of that logic where they say this, all men are whatever, all you know whatever, you know, it does seem like you know all leftist men seem to be prone to this because you know university is. I go there. University is dominated by leftist men. So you know, what, what does that what does that say about the left? I mean, you know, if they're feminists, if they really wanted to target, you know, conservative, you know, men or manly men, like, why didn't they commission a report into, like, sexual harassment and assault in the, like, trades professions? I mean... Yeah, exactly. It would be non-existent because, you know, the thing is, right-wing men have values, okay? I mean, they think men are violent and, you know, prone to rape or toxic whatever you know but right-wing men are they have values they have they have character okay um and they care about they care about those things so they care about they care about their reputation as well okay so right-wing right-wing men have the have the character and they do not commit these crimes um so you know i just I, again they're trying to use this victim group and try to create this victim group and make it look like they're somehow facing this sort of oppression, but in reality, it's simple. It's bad, but it's more simple. Okay, sexual assault is a problem, we know that, but you're going beyond the problem and sort of making it seem like a cultural issue when it's not. Yeah, 
I mean, you know, nobody disputes that, you know, sexual assault and uh, harassment is bad. But, you know, because, yeah. like, this report is being used to push a uh, political uh, agenda and because it is so flawed, it basic, basically means yeah. we, we don't actually have an accurate picture of, you know, what the real, you know, rate of, like, sexual assault and uh, harassment is. So, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, not enlightened at all. We're not, you know, maybe we should do our own um, poll, you know, maybe that allows to be much better than this particular thing done by these, all these organizations. Um, they're biased, misleading. I'm not going to trust it. You know, I'm just going to, I understand sexual assault is a problem, but, you know, catcalling or staring or anything like that, that is not harassment. That is not assault. That is just how it is. Women do that to men. Men do that to women. That's just how it is. And claiming that is sexual harassment or assault, it actually denigrates the, you know, actual victims of, you know, sexual harassment, exactly. and, you know, violent sexual assault, which is, you know, a very traumatic experience. And like, you're, you're claiming yeah. that, oh, someone stared at me like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a victim. I mean, <laughs> that's nothing like you're comparing yourself to, you know, these people who've been, you know, violently raped. Exactly. I mean, it's funny because, you know, the left, um, some, some feminists, they hate transgenders for some, you know, because they think transgenders are resulting in devaluing women because they're saying that only a woman, only a woman can sort of go through things like go through their particular biological processes, for example. So they're saying transgenders devalue women by doing that, um, you know, but at the same time, these feminists are devaluing this this, this this actual problem by inserting all these superficial things into it. Um, you know, again, hypocrisy at its best. Um, and you know, it just goes to show that you know they have no concern about actual problems. They just want to create more and more problems, and they want to expand their negativity and make things worse for everyone else. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's move over to America now. Now, Donald Trump, uh, I think we can even say, has had an uh, eventful week. Uh, last week he tweeted uh, that he was uh, banning transgender individuals from serving in any capacity in the US military because they, they can't afford the expense and the the distraction. This has, of course, caused outrage uh, fr from the left. Uh, now, most of your supporters thought that it was the, the right thing to do, as they argue that you know, trans people aren't mentally capable given their uh, condition of serving uh, in the military. Um, but, but I'm of the opinion that you know he went too far. I mean, there's already trans people serving in the in the in the U.S. military, uh, and I, I think that uh, a person's uh, ability to serve in, in the in the U.S. military should be made on a case by case basis. Like, I don't think it's fair to just have a blanket rule that you know all trans people are incapable of serving. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I do support his decision because well, I have reasons, but I think I completely understand um, people who oppose at who oppose the decision and who say that he went too far. I completely understand that um, because, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, not everyone on the right is, you know, a Christian fundamentalist or is, you know, a fascist. Okay? Only a minority are. You know, most people don't support completely outright banning particular people from the military, for example. Um, Islam is a different story because Islam is an external threat. This is an internal issue. Um, so people do not really, you know, sort of support, even on the right, support completely outright banning a particular group from this particular organization. Um, you know, the thing is, that the thing is, many transgender people do have um, these high rates of mental instability, especially those who undergo um, the medical procedures, the hormone therapy, for example. I mean, those banning those may is a good thing, definitely. Um, but, you know, many transgender people still have the mental instability, even afterwards, even afterwards, they get it. That's what polls show, that's what surveys show, that's what studies show. Um, so I think it's a very sensitive topic, I get that, but ultimately that's what the studies, that's what the evidence shows. Um, and second, they do cause disruptions and um, do cost a lot. Also, remember, the US military does fund um, you know, transgender people's medical procedures, which we are all against. And that's what the conservatives in America, that's what the right-wing people, the right-wing representatives and senators in the Republican Party, that's what they wanted. They wanted to 
ban the funding of medical procedures and ban um, you know, any transgender people who are mentally unstable and those who do undergo particular medical procedures. Um, but they, didn't, they, they weren't expecting this at all. Yeah, I, I mean, well, the, as many people pointed out, that the funding for actually, like, you know, helping military people transition was, you know, incredibly low compared to, like, the entire U.S. military budget, which, like, the U.S. military, they, you know, waste money on, on heaps of different things. So uh, it's, not, yeah, it's not like this, true. this yeah. was, you know, a huge uh, burden on the, the military budget. And if, like, conservatives were concerned about funding for, you know, trans uh, people in, in the military, like, they could have just defunded that. Why did, why, why did an entire ban, you know, need to happen? And if you, like, yeah. argue that, you know, that none of them, you know, are mentally capable of, like, so in the military but you, by that logic you know you are you saying that they can't serve in other occupations as well i mean can they not be police officers as well like like where do you stop well the thing is um that when Obama actually reversed the law and allowed transgender people into the military and, you know, actually said that um, we will fund them, the Department of Defense actually acknowledged in in their website, acknowledged that, you know, particular transgender people are will be unable to actually take part in um, the military procedures in, you know, particular military activities while having their procedure. So, they were keeping transgender people in the military, um, even the ones who were going through their procedures, um, you know, which take which take years, and you know they 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 acknowledge that these people, despite being in the military, will be unable to actually serve, unable to do anything. They they'll they'll you know continue to be, um, I don't know, they, they'll be getting the therapy um, while they're getting the procedure. So you know they did acknowledge that. But I get I I understand how that doesn't necessarily mean you should ban the entire group from it. Um, and that's why many conservatives are saying that's why many Republicans, you know, many Republicans, as I said, they, they wanted um to ban the procedures and they wanted to ban the funding and they wanted to ban any transgenders who were mentally unstable um if they were going through that particular procedure. Um, and many Repub Republicans wanted that, but they they even those Republicans, those right wing Republicans, even they were surprised and shocked by Trump's decision. Um, again, I think, you know, the thing is, it is quite risky that the risk is the huge factor here. And, you know, again, um, it's like saying, you know, we, we know there are some good Muslims, but we don't want to let all of them in because, you know, we know it's a risk, you know, because we know that letting some of them in is still risky, even though we may know they're good Muslims. Um, so, you know, I think that's the logic we are sort of seeing here. And that's logic I'm using as well when I'm supporting Trump's decision. Well, I, I, there's no, like, transgender terrorists. Like, they're not blowing up, you know, planes and that. I don't think that's a fair comparison, you know, at, at all. Well, yeah, I mean, this, uh, ultimately, it's, I, I think ultimately it's the logic that is used, you know, I mean, I'm not saying transgenders are dangerous or like that in that sense, in that sense. Um, what I'm saying is that, you know, they st mental problems do have an impact on being on the military. The military is a very, it's, 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 it requires such high mental strength to be in the military, you know, uh, 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 like I couldn't be in the military because, you know, I do not have that mental um, sort of strength. So the thing is, the logic here is that if, you know, this entire group as, as a group is defined by mental some mental problems you know which is you know that's how that is how it is you're, you're injecting hormones you know artificial hormones into your body and you're living your life through that um so if these people have that sort of um situation then you know it's kind of hard to allow the entire group into it but i do i think ultimately in this issue we need to sort of come to the middle ground at least you know sort of meet each other halfway at least and agree that at least you know there are Trans, some trans people who definitely cannot be in the military um, if they are going through a procedure because the procedures usually mean they are quite um, mentally turbulent those days in, in that particular time. So I think we need to agree. I think that, that is something we can agree with, I think. Well, there was also the um, speculation that uh, this ban, because it came out of nowhere, was part of a, a 5G chess move from Trump. Or was he trying to uh, distract from his dispute with his Attorney General, uh, Jeff Sessions? Was it to get funding for his border wall from Congress? I mean, we saw the Obamacare repeal fail again. I don't know what number of times this has failed because uh, John McCain, he returned yeah. from uh, fighting brain cancer to vote against Obamacare, which, 
uh, you know, was interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's quite that's quite committed, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think it may have been that sort of 5D chess. Um, you know, we all love the 5D chess talk. It gives us hope. Um, but you know, it, it may also have been an attempt by him to secure funding for the wall. Um, because there were many Republicans who were saying that you know we want to stop the funding, we want to stop the funding for the procedures, we want to stop. Um, we want to have greater sort of um, rules for transgender people into the military. So and. Trump may have sort of tried to appeal to them by giving them this extra thing and, you know, getting more of their support, sort of giving the, so giving them a thing, but also giving them insurance as well um, and getting more support for legislation regarding the wall and funding the wall. Um, that, that may also have been the case because remember, Trump is not someone who is exactly against LGBT people. He doesn't really have anything wrong with it. Back then, he had nothing wrong with, you know, he, he was quite he was quite progressive for a while. You know, he, he is progressive in many ways. Um, he has nothing wrong with gays in the military, for example. Um, you know, so he, he has been among various LGBT circles, for example, in New York, and he has always acknowledged that. Um, so Trump isn't this this Nazi Hitler who's trying to, you know, oppress transgenders. That's not true. Trump passed a law um, saying, well, not sorry, not passed a law. Trump issued a letter um, forcing teachers to use students' preferred pronouns or else they'll be investigated for civil rights violations. That is a leftist's biggest dream come true. He, that's what they want, practically. Um, and he, and he, that's why he did, he gave yeah. that. Um, so you can't just say Trump, you know, Trump, Trump is sort of oppressing transgenders because he's not. You know, he's he's done this for a reason. It may have been a 5D chess move as well. Well, that's uh, another thing that people were pointing out that it appeared to break an election promise as well. I mean, he didn't promise this. I mean, he, yeah, prote he exactly. protected. Yeah. The, uh, he promised to protect the LGBT. He said yeah. T as well. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. That, that, and of course, we don't like politicians, you know, breaking election commitments. So there, there's that issue yeah. as well. But he also had uh, quite a dramatic week. I mean, there was his. Uh, new communications director Ant Anthony uh, Scaramucci, who uh, came in uh, and already left after ten days, but in the meantime he forced uh, White House Chief of Staff Ryan Priebus uh, out of his job. So it it's it's been quite turbulent, but it was pointed out to me, you know, that at least no one's you know uh, you know dying, you know, under uh, you know President Trump's administration. I mean, sure there's this chaos in the White House, but at least the country is still functioning. Yeah, I mean, there is some chaos and it's to be expected. I mean, if you're draining the swamp, then it is to be expected that there is going to be some um, turbulence within the White House regarding staff, regarding particular, you know, particular people within the administration. Um, as for the election promise, um, yeah, he never promised that. He said he will promise LGBT people from Muslims, from the actual oppressors, you know, the people who want to throw them off buildings, the people who want to burn them alive, you know, in America. Um, Christians don't want to do that. Christians may, may be against your lifestyle and maybe against same-sex marriage, but they don't want to throw you off buildings. Only a very small minority of radical sort of, they aren't even Christian. They aren't Christian. That's not Christianity. Um, only a small minority of those people would want to do that, you know, but people who are coming to America from the Middle East, terrorists, they throw, they throw gays out of buildings. You know, we, all, we all saw what happened in um, the Pulse nightclub. You know, that's what happens. But they, you know, they continue to say, they were like, we have nothing wrong with Muslims. You have nothing wrong with Islam. And they would rather care about same-sex marriage. They'd rather care about those superficial, trivial things rather than care about their safety and security. You know, that's less important to them. And that's what Trump said. Trump said, I will protect your safety. And, you know, if, if I see gay gay marches or, you know, gay protests, I would expect those things to be on the agenda, not same as marriage, but actual important things. That's, that's what I would at least expect. Well, I still think, you know, barring, you know, transgender people from certain jobs, I, I, I still think that's a pretty uh, poor, a poor move from, you know, any government, despite what they, uh, you know, might say about uh, protecting LGBT safety. But we are um, completely out of time. We managed to cram all of these topics into, I think we went a bit over time, but there was a lot to get through. So thank you, Sukath, once again, yeah. for being my co-host. It was my pleasure. 
And I'll try to get all the reminders in very quickly so we can end the show. So don't forget the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Please consider supporting the work of The Unshackled by becoming a patron on Patreon and scoring some of the awesome benefits. Unshackled merchandise is now for sale at uprightmarket.com. And don't forget you can subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.